kind of stuff. And glory to God that he is shameless, you know. God, I can't make God ashamed of me. I, you know, it's just amazing. God could have been ashamed of me and probably deserves to be ashamed of me. For I'm ashamed of myself sometimes. How about you? Yeah, but somehow he loves me in spite of myself. So God's shameless, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, that you are is all I can say to you. Man, we got to look. We're looking at the last few verses of James today. How many of you have been, uh, been touched by Brother James? Uh, it's hard to make it through. Yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, he, he touches all of us, doesn't he? he? I mean, he really gets on uh, some stuff. And, the, you know, further you go, it, it, I, if, you didn't, if, if you didn't get touched by anything in the book of James, you, you probably either weren't here, wasn't paying attention, or, or you need to go back over it again. I mean, get online and look at, listen, and listen, because I guarantee you, all the different things James talked about, good and gracious alive, man. James is a book about, about practicing what you preach. It's about a life that is touched by Christ, is a life that, um, that acts like it. I mean, if you, if, you don't, if you don't reflect it out of your living life, the fact that, that the Holy Spirit is in you and has changed the way you think and live and, and practice your life, then James says there's a real question as to whether there's a Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. And that, that because the, the Spirit of God in you causes you to live out the things of God. And it doesn't mean that we always are perfect, but it means that when we're not, the Holy Spirit convicts us of this. And the Holy Spirit says, whoa, wait a minute, this is the wrong way. Or back up, buddy. You owe somebody an apology. Or, or stop that. Or like, you know, are you in there, Mabel? <laughs> you better come on out. Don't make me have to come in there after you, you know. Because God, how many of you know that God will mess up your high? You know, I mean, God will, God will, yeah, God will run into the building and just crash everybody. I mean, he'll spoil everybody's fun to get one of his kids out of there, you know. Yeah, I know it. You coming out, Mabel, it might be in a wheelchair. It might be on a crash cart somewhere, but I'm coming. Right? Don't make me come up in there and ruin everybody else's good time because you won't come out, you know. And, uh, and so God, go, man, God, like that song said, boy, God goes after you. You on a mountain, God, God goes up the mountain. You in a shadow, God lights up the shadow. I mean, God's coming after you, buddy, because you belong to him. You're his property. You've submitted to him. You said, I want you to be king of my life. That's what you said. To make Jesus the savior of your life, you've got to make him the Lord of your life. What does Lord mean? It means master. It means boss. And if I surrender and say, Lord, you are the boss of my life, you are the master of my life, then I can't be the master anymore. We can't have two masters He's the master, what am I? I'm the servant, I'm the slave, I'm surrendered to him. And I've given him permission to come in and to control my life. I've asked him and I've said, I want you to take me and Lord, help me in, from, to keep from messing up all of this and, and do what you want to do in me so that I can reflect your glory, which is why I was created on this earth to start with, so that I can fulfill the purpose that I was created for, which is to reflect you to all of the world. How many of you want to create, uh, want to uh, accomplish the purpose that you were created for? I'm going to say all of you do. I'm going to say, if you could ask God one question, that question would be, God, why am I here? Well, God's already answered that question. And the Bible's filled with the answer to that question that says, you are here because I want you to reflect me to these other people out here so they can see me through you and be drawn by faith to be like you and reflect the glory of God. You, that, that's your purpose. That's why God created you. That's why he saved you. That's what the church is. You know, he said, you don't, you don't take a, a, a lamp and, uh, and put a bushel basket over it. You take it up on the hillside and you take the lamp, take the basket off of it so it can light up the world. Yeah, yeah. My goodness, yeah, how much clearer can God be about his purpose for our life? And James is basically saying, if you don't live like this, you are condemned. 
You know, Wesley was, was talking and sharing, you know, what the truth about sin and, and that we are sin and, we, and our lives are sinful and we're sinners because we sin. And we sin because we like to sin because sin is fun. Don't, don't ever tell anybody sin's not fun. It is fun. We, um, if it wasn't, we wouldn't do it, right? right? I mean, come on, man, you know? I mean, we have to be encouraged to leave our sin. We don't have to be encouraged to do it. Oh, we want to, you know, I mean, our bodies crave to do it because our bodies are sinful, you know. And in sin, David said, in sin did my mother create me, uh, conceive me. And it doesn't mean she was having adultery whenever she was conceived. That means that from the very moment of conception where the, where the, where the, where the sperm hit the egg, uh, David said, I'm a sinner from that point because I get polluted blood. I get... I get that blood that's passed down from Adam's generation all the way down to whatever generation you are, and I got polluted blood running in my veins. I got sinful blood running in me, and I'm a sinner. But in spite of that, Jesus loved me, and God loved me, and sent a Savior that whose blood was perfect, not full of sin, so that his blood could wash me clean, and I could be in heaven with God, and I could be cleansed before the Lord. And James says, that is so majestic that if that happens to you, you will never be the same. Now, are you going to be perfect? No, uh, not this side of heaven. But you're going to be striving to be. You're going to want to be. I mean, listen, if you tell me that you have Christ living in you and you don't want to be holy, I'm telling you, you don't have him living in you. I'm telling you, you need to back up and, and repent and confess and get clean with God because your heart is not reflecting an attitude that reflects the nature of God that you say is living on the inside of you. And this is what James is all about. He's been telling us faith without works is dead. The whole book is about, about what it looks like and what it acts like to be a child of God. And the amazing thing about the books of, book of James is that it was one of the first books written to Christians. It was written to the tribes scattered abroad because there was no Apostle Paul yet and there were no Gentile churches yet. There were only Jewish people that came out of those Old Testament times and, and found the truth about the Messiah and they trusted Christ and they started forming little churches like this and they didn't have any theology. They didn't know anything about God. All they knew about was Judaism and, 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 and sacrifices and altars and blood doves and rams and all that. I mean, they didn't know anything. They didn't have a Bible like we have. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to think about God. They didn't know how to reflect God. They didn't know anything about God. And there weren't even any Gospels yet for them to turn to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were, you know, they were, they were years away from being even, even penned by the Holy Spirit through the men. I mean, this was some of the first things that Christians ever heard from, from the Spirit of God is this book. And James says, this is what the Spirit of God says the Christ life is all about, right here. Right where the rubber meets the road. And in these last few verses, let me just read you what I wrote. I mean, I hope, did, did you guys pick this up before, you know, when you came in? Now, the reason I gave you this is because I anticipate that I might mess this up. And um, I might not get everything said I need to get said. And so, I gave you this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, brother. Uh, <laughs> that's one of my bees right there, one of my killer bees. Yeah, well, he knows me. Uh, but this is for you to take home and read in case I don't get said everything I need to say to you today. So you, you can read this and you can understand what I'm talking about because I'm kind of I'm kind of getting a little nitty here today. A little, you know, I'm, the, scriptures, the Scripture says that we are to rightly divide the Word of God. Now, that means that that the Word of God contains concepts and, 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 and theologies and issues that are intricate, that sometimes they flow together and we need to have the mind of God so that we can separate in these passages what it's talking about 
and we can give the people clear understanding about even these little uh, seemingly interwoven things uh, that, 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 that would be confusing, that would mess them up in their way of thinking about certain things. And this passage, James 5, 13 through 18, is one of those passages. It's talking about faith healing. It's talking about praying for the sick. And it's, and it's interwoven, and it seems like, and, it, and, and most people interpret it, or many people interpret it, to be talking about a single person that would be sick and be in need of prayer. And then as you hear these five verses, you're going, those verses seem to be talking about something else. I mean, you know, like some of the verses are talking about, about confession and forgiveness and, and salvation can, uh, can save a soul from, from death. Uh, sozo, which is a word always used for, for eternal salvation of a soul. It's a salvation word, can save a soul from going to hell when they die. I mean, you know, and then it's talking about calling for the elders and let them pray. So you got, you got, you're praying for yourself and then you got elders praying and then you got anointing with oil and then you got confession of sin and then God will forgive you and then you'll be forgiven of your sin and then you could be healed because you've been forgiven of your sin and then, you know, Elijah was a man like us and all, and, and you're going, and you're going, what, what is the theology of that? Now, you might not be saying that because you don't care. You know, I mean, all you know is when I get sick, I'm praying. You know, I mean, seriously. It's like old Richard Roberts said. How many of you know, have heard of Oral Roberts? You've heard of Oral Roberts? Well, Oral is with the Lord right now, but his son is Richard Roberts. Well, back in my generation, this was the 70s, 80s, and so forth on up, Oral Roberts was a big faith healer. I mean, he was a big, that was one of his big messages. And he, he did worldwide crusades, man. I mean, he was like, he was like everywhere in big stadiums and everything. And people would come down and, and be prayed for to be well and all that kind of stuff. And he would claim miraculous healings and touching his hands and people being healed of diseases and all that kind of stuff. And then he built a hospital. And this hospital was at Oral Roberts University and had a big medical center. So now, the, now it was, all right, Oral, you a big faith healer. You pray for people and God heals them. Why are you building a hospital? I mean, don't those two contradict each other, really, you know? If God's going to heal them, why do they need a hospital and that kind of thing, you know? And, and so Richard Roberts was asked about this one day, and Richard Roberts said this. And I thought, this is really smart, really, actually. One of the few, no, never mind. <laughs> never mind, I didn't say that. But Richard Roberts said, Richard Roberts said, um, all right, when I get sick, I take an, when I get a headache, I take an aspirin, and I pray, and I ask God to remove my headache. So whether the aspirin cures the headache or the prayer cures the headache or some mystical combination of both of those clear the headache, well, it really doesn't matter, does it? The headache's gone. And, 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 and that's, the, that's the conflict of these five verses of James. That's the conflict right there. Do, 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 I, do I pray for myself to be healed when I get sick or when I'm suffering or when I'm afflicted, which is another King James word? Or do I call for the elders of the church and let them pray for me so that somehow God might hear their prayers and God might do something for me because somebody else prayed for me? Which way is it? What are we talking about? This is like a crazy combination. These verses are all mingled in. It's like ridiculous. It's like, what are you saying? And so here's what I'm submitting to you, and this is why I gave you this, this sheet right here, okay? How many of you, is anybody confused right now? Okay, all right, so far, so far, so good. All right, let me read. All right, let me read the, the little opening paragraph I, I gave to you. Uh, we come now to the conclusion of James' message to the tribe scattered abroad with a short six-verse insert on the intriguing subject of healing. The theology of healing often falls into one of two categories. First, the theology that overstates the position by offering too much. This view promises believers that it is always the will of God 
that by uh, that they be immediately healed, and if healing doesn't occur, it is because the recipient doesn't have enough faith, or there is some unconfessed, unrepented sin in their life. The second camp understates the position by moving to the opposite extreme and offering little or no hope that God will heal. So in Christianity throughout the years, the camps about healing have generally fallen into one of those two categories. Either people that believe way too much, they believe that that healing is in the atonement. They believe that, that by his stripes we are healed, that's in Isaiah, uh, is talking about our physical bodies and that if you get saved, God is going to not only save your soul, but he's going to heal your body and your promise to be well and that every Christian should be well. And if you are not well, it is because you have sinned, displeased God, fallen under the judgment of God, or somehow uh, you are not living the life that you should be living. And if you will speak the word, this is where the, word, quote, word of faith movement comes from. And if you'll just say it, and, and, and speak it, then you're going to become it, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And this is the most ridiculous theology you've really ever heard in your life. Uh, really. I mean, it's really ridiculous. It, it just overstates things. And then, and because we know it's not true, because I guarantee you there are people sitting in this sanctuary right now that love the Lord, serve the Lord, walk with the Lord, try to live as close to the Lord and be obedient to the Lord as they possibly can, and you are sick. And you may not even tell anybody because you're so intimidated by the fact that if you're sick, something must be wrong with you because, you know, I'm telling you, you ought to be well because Christ healed you in the atonement and you're still sick. And so uh, all we've done is pushed you underground. So now you're scared to talk to us because we're going to think you have some unconfessed sin in your life and you need to come clean before God. And so we haven't helped you. We pushed you underground. So now you won't even talk about it because that theology is wrong. Some of the greatest saints of God have suffered and been sick and died. Most of the faith healers that have ever put forth the message that the atonement, you know, guarantees your healing, they had died of cancer and heart disease and stroke and all. I mean, the Catherine Kuhlmans, the Oral Roberts, the cancer got him. I mean, come on, you know, if you can heal everybody else, how you die from a sickness if, it, if, it, if it's God's will that every Christian be made? Well, it's ridiculous. Some of the greatest saints of God, I, Bill, I think of, I, I think of oh, uh, 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 David Ring. David Ring. David Ring was born with cerebral palsy. I mean, he, he can't, he can barely walk, and he barely talk, and he talk like this, and he that. I can't even take Jesus. And he preaches. He's an evangelist, and man, I mean, you, you know, you think, well, I don't, couldn't really understand that. Well, if you listen to him about thirty seconds, all of a sudden you can hear every word he says. It just, and man, people get saved and all that. And they said, he said, they told me I never have children. I've got three boys now. I mean, he said, he said, I, I looked at God. I think, God, I want you to heal my body so I can be normal. And then he said, God said, what normal? And, 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 then, and then he looks at you and said, you think you normal? <laughs> you know? <laughs> And he, I mean, in his affliction, he brings glory to God because God uses him, uh, basically uses his affliction to highlight the grace and the glory and the greatness of a God that can give somebody strength to serve him even though they don't get healed in their body, which I think is a greater miracle than getting healed personally. I think if God gives you the strength that his grace is sufficient for you to walk with him even if you don't get what you pray for, that that's more of a reflection of a nature surrendered to God than somebody that gets happy because they get healed. Who couldn't get happy if you get healed? Bless God, it's a miracle. Sure, it's a miracle, and I pray for it, and I, I pray for you to have it. I, you come up and you say, Pastor, I, I need you to pray for me. The first thought in my life is not, well, what kind of sinner are you? No, 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 the first thought in my life is, I love you, and I want you to be well, and I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to ask God to heal your body, and I want you to be well. 
And I, I mean, my heart beckons God for you to be well. And I'm not asking God why you are sick. I don't want to know. I don't, I mean, if you are sick because of some sin in your life, you, the Holy Spirit will convict you of that. The Holy Spirit will speak to your heart. I'm not a judge of the people. James all through the book said, man, don't judge other people. There's only one judge and one lawgiver, and that's God. And so you don't need to stoop to the level of trying to be God because if you judge others, you are not obeying the law. You become a judge of the law, and you're breaking the law even by judging somebody else. And you and that person you're judging, both of you are going to have to stand before the Lord one day. So you better remember that when you put past judgment on somebody else's life. And judgment generally is a reflection of you and not them anyway. Judgment, your judgment is what you would do if you did that, basically, you know. I don't know, man. If I was over there, I'd tell you what, they would be there. I bet they over there converting with all those prostitutes and sinners. How, how do you know any of that? No, what you're saying is if you were over there, that's what you would be doing. And so judgment comes out of your own heart. It does. It reflects you. It reflects more of you than it does them. How do you know what they're doing? How do you know what's in their heart? You don't. Only God knows and only the person knows. So I'm just saying that these kind of thoughts were true in the first churches that were ever existed on this earth. And they needed answers about how to pray. I mean, if they were, if they were sick, what, did they, what are they supposed to do? I mean, how are you supposed to handle it? And do we pray for others or do we pray for ourselves? And what in the world is that all about? And I'm just saying in these six verses, all of this is intertwined, and I'm going to try to unspin it for you, okay? We got a, we got a second. I mean, does, does this seem like it's an important thing to you? All right, all right, praise the Lord, all right, hallelujah. I, I think it is because, you know, we need to know what to do, right? I mean, if you're, if you're sick, you need to know, okay, do I need to do something about this? Or can I go to the elders and ask them to do something? And, and which one do I need to do? Because it seems, it, it, both of them, I'm, I'm just, I'm saying that, that, that these verses reflect not one kind of person, these verses reflect two different kind of people who pray two different kind of prayers, depending on which one of these people you are, and it requires us to have two different actions. In other words, this is not just like a single person that all six verses apply to a single life when somebody is sick. They're two different types of sickness. They require two different types of prayer, and the results are two different things in life. So let's intertwine these things. First of all, let's look at, let's look at, at verse 14, 13 and 14 real quick. Start a verse. All right, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Let's talk about that for just a second. Notice what James is saying here. James is saying, all right, if you're having a bad day, all right, say to your neighbor, uh, a sick day. Uh, come on, I'm, did I just say, say to your neighbor, a sick day? Well, then why are you standing here looking at me, sitting there? All right. <laughs> all right, hello. Do you understand the words coming out of my mouth? All right, say to your neighbor, all right. If you're having a bad day, suffering, sick, afflicted, it's a bad day, right? He says, if you're having a bad day, you need to pray. And he said, if you're having a good day, everybody say, you're happy, you're merry, all right, you're joyful, then you are to praise the Lord. Sing psalms which the word in Greek means to sing hymns and psalms, to, to praise the Lord. And the word is a verb, and it, I'm no, I don't want to strain a gnat and swallow a camel, but just go with me. And the word is a verb, and the verb is a continuous action verb, which simply means that when I praise, I'm just doing something that is a continuation of something that I'm already doing every day. Every day, because these are not mutually exclusive, Right? 
I mean, it's not like you have to choose one or the other. You can do both of them. When, you're, when things are bad and going bad and you're suffering and afflicted, you can pray and you can praise, right? And when things are going good and you're merry and you're happy and you're lighthearted, you can pray then too, right? And you can praise, so these are not mutually exclusive, but James is saying, all right, I, he, he says, I want, I'm, I'm trying to make a point to you is what James is saying. James is saying, you know, but, but one of the points here is that, 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 that Christian people are singing people, you know. Christian people are joyful people. I don't know if you're aware of this, and this is history, but the, the, the first mention of Christians outside the Bible they were mentioned, the, the, the Christians were first called Christians, according to the book of Acts, at a city called Antioch. Before, before that, they didn't know what to call them. I, I guess they called them, you know, Jesus followers, or they called them, you know, followers of the way, or, or, or bab, baptism people. I don't know what they, what they called them. But in the, at Antioch, there was a city, and a bunch of Christians came in there and, and, and formed a church, and the, it was the citizens of Antioch, not, not the church, not the saved people. It was the outside people, the lost people, that, that looked at that bunch of Christians, and they said, hey, what do we call those guys? And then somebody said, I don't know, let's call them Christians, which means little Christ. It means, it means reflections of Christ, Christian, a Christian. Let's call them a Christian. In other words, the citizens of Antioch looked at them and said, they, I don't know what to call them. Let's just call them little Christ. Let's call them, you know, Christians. And, and, and I'm just thinking, you know, uh, has anybody ever called you a Christian? Has anybody ever said that about you? Because I'm getting, the point I'm getting to is I'm not sure you have the right to say it about yourself until somebody else says it about you. You hear what I'm saying to you? Until somebody outside notices, man, you must be a Christian. You must be a Christian. Oh, glory to God, now I can call myself one because somebody actually said I must be one because you reflect in Christ. On his. But in the Bible, in the Bible, the first time the Christians were called Christians was at a town of, called Antioch. Well, outside the Bible, the first mention of these believers in Christ being being Christians and, and mentioning them was mentioned in 112 A.D. And it's not important, really, you remember the date, but, but that was, you know, like 70 years after Jesus went on the cross and all that. It was mentioned by a Roman governor. His name was Pliny, P-L-I-N-Y. I know you're going to look it up on Google and all that. Just look up Pliny, P-L-I-N-Y. He was called Pliny the Younger. He was governor, a Roman gover governor of a province, and they were studying the Christians. They were having a trial of the Christians because these Christians were weird people and doing these crazy things, and so they were put on trial by the Roman government, and Pliny was part of the research crew, and they reported to him and blah, blah. And anyway, he just came to the conclusion that these Christians did strange, mysterious things, but they weren't really a danger. They, you know, they, they had this crazy God, and they worshiped this crazy crazy belief system and all that, but they were really not a threat to the Roman government, so we don't need to kill everybody, you know, just let them keep what they're doing. But here's what Pliny wrote about the Christians. This was, this was one of the first mentions of what Christians were outside of the Bible in secular history. It's written in the, in the histories that Pliny wrote, and he said, they gathered together at dawn to sing praises to Christ. That's what Pliny said was noteworthy about these Christians. That they gathered at dawn. Why'd they gather at dawn? To sing praises to Christ. I'm just saying that, that as James is saying, man, if you're happy, excited, praise the Lord. And, and, and that one of the things we are noted for as Christians is that we sing praises to Christ. You know, We're joyful and we praise and honor him. Because praises open up the gates of heaven, right? Psalms 22 says that God inhabits the praises of his people. We learn from, uh, uh, from the wedding at Cana of Galilee, and I hope it's something you'll never forget, that Jesus goes where he's invited. And if you want Jesus to be with you, invite him. You say, man, I'm bankrupt. Well, have you invited him into your finances? Well, I'm heartbroken. Well, have you invited him into your relationship? Well, I, you know, the kids, I can't control them. Well, have you invited him to give you wisdom about that? 
I'm just saying, don't expect him to show up where he's not invited. And where he's invited and prays open the door of heaven, invites Christ to come in and to inhabit this place, inhabit our life. And so James says, man, you're having, a, you're having a bad day? You need to praise if you're having a great, I mean, to pray. If you're having a good day, praise the Lord, man. Sing to God and enjoy life. And so we're going to look just quickly, and, and, and I do want to, because, you know, next week is Easter, and I can't just hold this over, right? All right, yeah, I'm going to probably have to. But anyway, not till next week. We'll have to do something else. All right. But I'm going to submit to you, all right, here are, the two, here are the two kinds of people that are mentioned here. One is somebody sick because, they're, because of their personal sin. First kind of person he's talking to are, is somebody who is sick because of their personal sin in their life. Now, what kind of sin it is, I have no idea. What they are doing that's causing them to be sick, I have no idea. I'm just thinking that the way it's talking here, it, 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 imply, it, it says really actually, and that's why I wrote you the little uh, note page I gave you because I gave you some interpretation of some of these original language words. And it's, the words are different. The way it talks about it are different. So there, it's talking about in some of this passage, people who are sick because of their own personal sin. Some of you in here are sick because of your own personal sin. I don't know who is. I'm not trying to accuse you. I don't know what you could even do that would be this. I mean, like somebody that smokes and then gets cancer, you know, I mean, it's directly related to, to what you're doing, you know. I mean, you have high blood pressure and you won't take your medicine and you're full of stress and tension and you're running around cheating on your wife and your husband or whatever, and you're all whacked out, and it leads to a stroke, well, you know, that might be something that was caused as a result of your, of, of, of your sin in your life. I, I tell you where you can go to look at, at this, really, if you want to. Go to Psalm 51. Now, not now, but go to Psalm 51. Write that down in your note, and look at what King David said about his sin. His sin was, you know, he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and he got her pregnant, and then brought her husband home from the battlefield and said, go in there and live with your wife and enjoy some good time. And, and Uriah looked at him and said, hey, no, we can't do that because the law of Israel says I can't go in and enjoy my family while my brothers are out on a battlefield fighting. So I, I thank you, sir. I appreciate the opportunity, but I'm going back to the battlefield because that's what I'm supposed to do. And so the, it foiled the plan for, for, for Bathsheba to say you Uriah, her husband, got her pregnant because when he comes back from the battlefield, she's going to be pregnant. It's going to be, oh, how did you get pregnant? Uh-oh, you've been doing something while I've been gone, right? Okay, so David's plan was to bring him back, let him be involved with her, let everybody think that he did that while he was back, and everything's going to be slick, man. You know, okay, nobody will notice all that. And, and, and then he wouldn't cooperate, so now everybody's going to know. So David says, all right, to the generals, put Uriah out in the middle of the fight, and when he's out there and the enemy's all around him, pull back our soldiers and let the enemy kill him. Yeah, so now she'll be a, now she'll be a widow. Well, then I can marry her as one of my wives, and then when she has a baby, hey, none the wiser. You know, hey, good glory to God, there's a new baby prince in the world. That was his plan. Now, how evil is that? How evil is that? And Psalm 51 is David's response to God when God sends his pastor in there, Samuel the prophet. Samuel the prophet is David's pastor. And he goes in there and he says, David, I got to have a little conversation with you. And it's not about church finances. I got, I, we got a problem here. You're the king. You're the judge. Let me give you, a, let me give you a, a, a scenario to adjudicate. There's this guy that's got a bunch of, bunch of lambs. I mean, he has thousands of them. He's rich. He has, they're just everywhere. And, and then there, he lives right next door to this poor little guy that only has one little lamb, one little pet lamb. This lamb is, eats at the dinner table. This lamb sleeps in a little bed beside his bed. I mean, this little lamb is loved and precious. It's only his one little lamb. Well, the rich guy who has all these lambs has a friend that comes by. And instead of going out there and getting one of his thousands, 
thousands of lambs and bar killing the lamb and barbecuing the lamb. He goes next door to his neighbor's house, gets that one little lamb, takes that lamb, kills the lamb, barbecues the lamb, and serves it to the neighbor, that, I mean the friend that just happens to come by. David, you're the king. You tell me what ought to be done with a person like that. And David was like us, man. David was livid with rage. David clenched his fist. His blood pressure went up, and he jumped up from the throne, and he said, the man that has done that ought to pay fourfold and die for what he did. Now, I'm just saying, look how quick David was to judge somebody for killing a lamb and stealing a lamb, and here he is with murder and manslaughter and adultery on his heart. It's mighty easy to blow up at somebody for a lesser action than your own when you're trying to hide something from God, don't you think? And David, and then Nathan uh, looked at him and said, uh, you're the man. I'm talking about you, buddy. That's you. And then he fell on the ground, and he rolled around on the ground, and he started repenting, and he said, God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. God, don't hold it. I, I was just kidding about that dying stuff, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and all that. And he paid fourfold. Uh, his, his son, uh, one of his sons, uh, Amnon, raped his daughter, Tamar. He did nothing about it. Absalom, his oldest boy, took matters into his own hand, which is what will happen, parents, if you don't be the parent. If you are not, if, if Daddy David, who was the sorriest dad on the face of the earth, had 51 kids and all of them were terrible, but if, if David, if David, listen, if David would have disciplined Absalom, or excuse me, Amnon for rape in Tamar, then Absalom would have never had to do anything. But I'm telling you that if you don't discipline your kids and you're not the parent, your oldest child probably is going to try to step in there and become the parent, and that's going to cause all kind of conflict in your family. Some of the reasons our families are so crazy is because you guys, as parents, aren't, aren't ruling your family. You're letting your kids rule your family. They decide where to go. They decide when we leave. They decide what's going on in life. And God says, you're the parent. You decide that. And so anyway, Absalom feels like he's got to punish Amnon. And so Absalom, uh, you know, kills Amnon, his brother, for raping his sister. And then Absalom decides, well, I need to take the kingdom away from my dad. And it becomes a civil war where Absalom is trying to take the kingdom from his own father. Fourfold. What would you say, David? What would you, what, what'd you say? You said the man that would do this ought to pay how, uh, fourfold? <laughs> All right. Uh, Amnon rapes Tamar. Absalom kills Amnon. Absalom tries to take away his kingdom. And then the one single thing that David told General Nathan was, uh, whatever happens, don't kill Absalom. Don't kill Absalom. Don't kill Absalom. Let him live. Well, don't kill Absalom. So Absalom's riding on a little donkey one day down the road, and he's got these long curls, by, you know, like a rock star or something. He's got these long curls, and they're bouncing up and down on his head, and he goes under a limb hanging low, and his limb hangs up in his hair, jerks him off the back of the donkey, and he's hanging up here like a pinata. And Nathan and his boys just happened to come by. And Nathan says, hot dog, boy. He said, all right, let's see how big of a pin cushion we can make out of him. And man, they just pierce him. They just slay him. They kill him. They mutilate him. Man, he's the enemy of the kingdom. He's trying to take the kingdom away from his own dad. He's a subversive. He's an anarchist. He's the enemy. And Nathan has no problem identifying that and says, let's kill the bum because that's what he deserves. And then they go to David and they say, oh, David, uh, we got some good news for you and some bad news. The good news is um, you're not going to have to worry about your kingdom being taken from you. And the bad news is because uh, Absalom's dead. And then David falls down on his face and starts crying and says, oh, Absalom, Absalom, how long will I have gathered you under my wing like a ch mama chick, mama hen does to her chicks, but you would not. Crying and, 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 and snot-nosing and... and then, Nathan says, get up off of the ground, you idiot. 
Man, all these people have put their life in jeopardy and you're throwing away their sacrifice and crying over somebody that tried to take the kingdom away from you. You're insulting the people that are trying to serve you. Get up and act like a man. Fourfold, David. You said he's going to pay fourfold, didn't you? And then because he repented, he didn't have to die. But Psalm 51 tells you all of the results of that sin, and every one of them are some physical ailment, some physical issue that happened in David's life. A guilty conscience, a knitted brow, an irritable temper, a brain that is filled with conflict and confusion and strife, a joyless life. All of these are physical results of the sin of adultery and manslaughter and sinning against God. I mean, there's your perfect example of what James is talking about when he says sometimes sin will cause you to be sick. Mm-hmm. And some of you that are sick are, mo- are sick because of this, most likely. What you did, I don't know. What happened, I don't know. But you are never going to be made well until you come to God for yourself. Nobody else can come for you. Nobody can confess your sin but you. Just like when you're saved, nobody can go before God and ask for salvation for you except you. You must personally represent yourself before God and say, God, I surrender. Come into my heart and save my soul. Nobody, You can't go to the elders and let them pray for you. God has no grandchildren, no great-grandchildren, only children who go for themselves and ask God, to save their life, confess their sin, repent of their sin, turn away from that, and say, God, I'm walking with you. And before you get healed, you are going to have to go before God and say, God, my life is filled with this. God, forgive me of this. I turn away. I walk away. God, I say the same thing as you say about it. It's wrong. It's sin. So, God, forgive me of my sin. And then stop doing whatever it is you're doing. Don't be sitting over here saying, God, heal me, God, heal me, God, heal me, God, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry. And then you still over here in your sin, just walking merrily down your way. Uh, No, 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 no. That's not repentance. To repent means to walk over here on God's side, and you and God both look at it together, and you say, God, I agree with you. This is wrong. And I'm separating myself from it. I'm not standing in my sin saying, I'm sorry, God, this is so bad, this is so wrong. And then just, you know, no, you get, you walk away from your sin and you walk over here with God and you got confess. Con means similar or same. Fess means to speak or to say. Even the Greek, homo. Homo means the, the same or similar. Uh, legeo means to speak and to say. The word confess means to say the same as, to speak the same as. And it says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we've got to leave our sin, walk over here with God, and say the same thing God says about our sin. It's wrong. I'm not going to do it. Forgive me. And God, cleanse my life and help me walk with you for the rest of my life and stay away away from whatever that was that is making me sick. And then you can say, God, now heal my body. Take away this sin. Take away these consequences, God. I'll walk with you. I'll serve with you. And I'm asking you to heal my life. And then he may do it. I don't know whether he will or not. I wouldn't say it's a guarantee. But I would say that you become a candidate for it to happen. But before that, you're not even a candidate. You're wasting your time. That's why that verse says, is anyone among you suffering? That word suffering is the word uh, 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 kakapatheo. I know it sounds funny. Kaka means evil. Patheo means pathological or physical. So the word kakapatheo means, is anybody living with sickness in their life because they are evil? Is the sickness is this an evil sickness? Kaka, evil, patheo, physical, uh, word suffering right there. Uh, is anyone among you kaka patheo? Is anyone among you, does anyone among you have sickness in their life because of evil? 
In other words, this sickness right here is, 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 is referring to somebody who's sick because of sin in their life. If they are, what does it say? Let him pray. Right? Am I missing that? Am I making too much out of that? No, I mean, if you are cockapatheo, it means there's a sickness in your life that is evil. It's caused by evil. And if that's it, don't come to me and ask me to pray for you because God is not going to heal you until you go before God, repent, confess, and ask God to cleanse your life and quit doing the evil that you're doing and live for Jesus. I mean, in simple little terms, that's what he says. So you got to do it for yourself. Don't think you can get any help from anybody else. Just like salvation, I can't help you get saved. You got to go before God and ask him personally and ask him to save your soul personally. Yeah. Same way with sickness and so forth. Is anyone cheerful? All right, now look at verse 14. Verse 14 is a whole different deal. Look at it. Is any among you sick? That word sick right there is the word astheno. It's what from what we get our English word anesthetic from the word astheno. Anesthetic has to do with anesthesia. Anesthesia literally means to make one weak. When you get anesthesia, anesthesia means to make one weak, literally. So what it's talking about here is anyone's verse 14, which is different from verse 13. Verse 13 is kakapatheo. It's, it's evil sickness. It's sickness that's attached to evil. But in verse 14, sick is astheno, which means uh, 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 there's no sin involved. It's just, a, it's just a general weakness that could be caused by anything. In other words, there's no moral judgment passed on in verse 14. It is like, it is like you're sick with no evil in it. If you're sick with no evil in it, what can you do? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him in, uh, with oil in the name of the Lord. So in other words, if you are sick because of nothing that is involved with sin in your life, you are, you, you are sick for a, a reason that is not associated with sin, you can get some help. You can call for the elders of the church. What, what, what's the procedure? He said, all right, call for the elders of the church. In the New Testament, there are, golly, man, it's time to quit. But yeah. all right, let me, let me just, let me, let me give you five minutes, okay? In five minutes, everybody say, okay, quit, stand up. All right, in, 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 uh, in the New Testament, there are three offices, generally speaking, for the, for the hierarchy of the church. There are bishops and pastors, which are generally interchangeable words. Either one are used, and the pastor is the head of the church, like Christ is the head of the body, and he surrenders to the great shepherd, and he's the under-shepherd, and so forth. The second one are deacons. Deacons mean, diakonos means one who stirs up dust. Not one who stirs up stink, by the way. One who stirs up dust. And the inference, the word picture is, they are so busy serving that they're running down the road with such great speed serving the church in the Lord that they're kicking up dust behind them as they go down the street. They're so busy serving the Lord. We have lots of deacons in our church. I don't know if you know this. We do. We have lots of deacons. You say, well, when were they elected? Well, whenever we ask them to do something. See, we don't have elections. That, that's the problem. The problem with deacons in other churches is they're elected. Because I'm going to tell you, I've been serving the Lord. I've been a pastor for 43 years. I'm going to tell you something. Every church I've ever been in, you could take some of the greatest, most honorable, most God-loving men, elect them to be a deacon, and they turn into a demon within two or three years. You know why? Because once they get elected, they, it becomes political. Because it's the people that they got to please who elected them so they'll vote for them again, and they can be a deacon again. And so that means every time somebody comes to you and says, I tell you what, that air conditioner is just too cold. Or, or those speakers are so loud. We didn't even hear. And then now you got to go in a deacon's meeting and bring up junk and get everybody mad. Why are you worried about that, man? We got soul. We got people out here lost, dying, going to hell. And you talking about, you talking about an air conditioner too cold? You know, you talking about speakers too loud or what color are we going to paint the wall in the bathroom? What's wrong with you? So what we do is, I, I went with a deacon yesterday to one of our, one of our, uh, our folks' house, 
to do spiritual work. He was a deacon all day yesterday. Absolutely. And today he's sitting here in church, and he's not been elected to anything. But he was a deacon yesterday because he was serving yesterday. And in Acts 6, it says the deacons are to uh, guard the fellowship of the church. So, and, and in, and, and in Tim, 1 Timothy 3, it says the deacon is to rule his own house well. Because if he doesn't rule his own house well, how can he rule over the house of God? So, there, so there's a little bit of rulership involved in being a deacon. I mean, it's, you're supposed to protect the fellowship. And you're supposed to help you know, keep things in order and all that. So we don't completely eliminate them from leadership. But they're basically servants. So we have pastors, and then we have deacons, and then we have elders. Elders are always mentioned in the plural. There's always an S on the end, which means more than one. And they're, they're like a church council. To the best of understanding, they're like a church council, and they are not just old people that are full of wisdom. They are, they are spiritual people. They are a group of spiritual leaders that, that have the heart of God and the wisdom of God, and, they, and, and, you, and you bring things to them, and they speak spiritually over it. They're kind of like a church council that, that, that helps the church stay straight and go straight and walk straight and be straight and all that kind of stuff. Well, he says, all right, if you're sick, Anasteo, with no evil in it, you can, you can get the elders, those spiritual people, those one walking with God, listening to God, hearing God, and you can go to those elders. And then he says, let them call for the elders. Now, this is not a command. You don't have to do it. He didn't say, you know, all right, I'm commanding you, get the elders, have them come down. And, you know, no, he said, but you can do this. Let him call. You have the permission. This is not a command. This is permission to do so. If you want to, you can do this. And notice it says, let them, let them call for the elders. In other words, let them call for the elders and, and, and of the church and let them pray over him. And it's like, okay, this is not a command to have healing services every week at the church. This is permission to take somebody who is sick because of no evil in it, take the elders to the person's house and let them go into the sick bed where the person is and let them gather around and let them speak to God on behalf of this person that is sick and ask God to save their soul and to, and, and to, to heal their life and to be with them and to, and to bring their body forth, you know, and, and, and you can do this. Now, if you want to bring them to church and let, let it happen at church, I'm not against that. I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to strain them that and swallow a camel, but but it really insinuates that you go, you go where they are because they're in a sick bed. And you pray over them, blah, blah, blah. And anoint them with oil. You say, why anoint them with oil? I have oil. We have oil. We anoint with oil. Everybody says, what is this oil about? And he said, this oil, it's like just, it's a physical oil. It's like olive oil. That's what it is. And you take it and you got a little vial and you put it on somebody's forehead or on their hand or whatever it is you might be anointing. And, 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 and the oil there, there are three things it could be. One, it could be an accompanying enablement, and I know that sounds weird, but an accompanying enablement means a physical something that represents something that will help you believe that something is happening. Baptism is, a, is an enabling, is an, a, is an enablement. Uh, baptism does not wash away your sins. Baptism is a picture of the life, the death, and the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when you do this, it is you doing something physical that will allow you to identify with the body of Christ so you can hopefully see physically what you just did spiritually. It is an accompanying enablement. It, it's a tool used to help you see these things. Jesus used this kind of stuff like uh, John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, you remember what Jesus did? Uh, there was a man that was born blind, and he said, Jesus, Jesus. He... And, and then Jesus said, uh, the disciples said, who sinned, this guy or his parents, that he was born blind? And, uh, and Jesus said, neither one, uh, but he's, he's, he was born blind so that the glory of God can be revealed. And then Jesus went, <laughs> spit on the ground. And then he got down, and he started doodling in it. Mixing the spit in the, in, the, in the clay. And then he got his little mud pie and he come up and he put it on the guy's eyes. Yeah, right. He was blind. He didn't see it coming. And, and, um, and he really probably didn't even know what Jesus did. And then one of his friends whispered in his ears, do you know what he just did to you? 
And he said, he just put spit, he just put mud on your eyes, made up spit. And the guy goes, ah! And Jesus said, go wash in the pool, slow them, and you'll see. Now, that was an accompanying enablement. Nobody's ever said that there's medicinal healing in mud made of spit packed on your eye. It was just Jesus' way of saying, I'm going to do something physical that when you do what I tell you to do and wash it off, it's going to matter. It's going to help you believe that, that, that I did this. It's, a, it's, going to, it's going to be something important for, so you can lock it in and, and believe it in your heart. So it, oil could be an accompanying enablement, or some people say it represents the Holy Spirit. But here's what I think the most. This is what makes most sense to me. Uh, oil was the... Uh, Oil was the medium of medicinal use in Jesus' day. In other words, oil in Jesus' day were like pills and capsules are today. Pills and capsules are a way to dispense medicine into our body. You know, they put the medicine in a pill or put it in a capsule, and then we take it. Well, then the medicine goes in us, and it's delivered through a pill or a capsule. Well, in Jesus' day, oil was the medium through which the medicine of that day was delivered. Give you a perfect, give you a perfect example. Perfect example is the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan in Luke 10, when the guy was in the ditch, beat up, tore up, about to die, the Bible says the Good Samaritan gets off his donkey, goes down, and pours oil in the wounds, not on them pours it in the wounds, wraps them up, puts them on his donkey, takes him to the Holiday Inn and says, hey, take care of him until I get back. Now, the point is that it, the reason he poured oil in is because oil was medicine. Yeah. And it carried, if there was anything to like salve or any uh, herbs or anything they were going to use as medicine, they put it in the oil and dissolved it in the oil. And when they poured the oil on, all the medicine went in there. And so here's what I'm saying to you. I'm saying that what James may be saying here may be nothing more than this. When somebody is sick, give them their medicine. When somebody's sick, give them their medicine and pray in the name of the Lord at the same time. And ask God to heal their life. Yeah, yeah. And when you do that, God may heal them. Because that sickness may not at all be for anything except the glory of God. How can the glory of God be revealed? Well, when somebody's miraculously healed, God's glorified. When somebody, when somebody is given the strength to walk in what they have, even though they didn't get healed, that glorifies God. I mean, my prayer is, God, either heal me. How many times have you prayed something like, God, either heal me or give me the strength to, to walk through this sickness yeah, yeah. so that I can reflect the glory of God? I don't want to be a crybaby and I don't want to be somebody over here, God, and heal me. I want to be somebody that everybody looks at and says, you see that person right there? It's no telling how much pain there is. It's no telling how much suffering. But look at that, the power of God. They just keep on talking about praise Jesus. We love the Lord. Thank you, God. I mean, man, that is the power of God right there because how bad are they suffering and they still have a spirit to say glory to God. Yeah, yeah. And so James is saying, man, when, you're, when you have sickness in your body and it's not because of sin, it's, it's astheno, it's sickness with no evil attached to it, you can get some help, man. You can call for the elders, let them pray over you, anoint you with oil. I mean, ask God to save you. I mean, it's to heal you and all that kind of stuff. And then, and then you know, he, he'll do it. And then, um, okay, y'all see I'm really struggling because I'm running out of, way out of time. And the prayer fail, and the prayer of faith. Now, here's the, sec, here's the one with... This is some more verses about the person who is a sinner. And it just says this, all right. Uh, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. That word save is sozo. It's the same word that's used for salvation everywhere. Notice the verse does not say, and the prayer of the elders. It says, and the prayer of faith, which means you're praying for yourself. It's not the elders praying for you. You're praying. Whenever you ask the Lord to save you in faith, that's the prayer of faith. And so here it is. So it's prayer of faith, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, you see, there's confession, there's ask for forgiveness, there's sins, there's all that involved in that verse. It all goes together as if sins have to be confessed, sins have to be forgiven, and then sickness can be healed. With all of that merging together, and it doesn't say, and the prayer of faith shall heal the sick. It says, shall save the sick. Sozo, salvation word, save from hell is what sozo actually means. 
And so this is clearly talking about somebody who needs the Lord, somebody who, 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 who needs to repent and, and be forgiven. Confess your faults one another, pray for one another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now that he's going to give you the perfect example of a righteous man and the prayer and so forth, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and heaven gave rain and produced its fruit. Now, just all right, sum it up. Sum it up with this. Let me get, hang on. Sum it up with this. <clears throat> um, the reason Elijah is used as the example of an effectual fervent prayer is because you need to know this. I'll show you that, that he's talking about somebody who needs, to be, who needs to pray for themselves because they got sin in their life. All right, here it goes. What is this talking about, this praying three and a half years and drought three and a half years and blah, blah, blah? This is talking about 1 Kings 17 and 18. In 1 Kings 17 and 18, Israel, the whole nation of Israel, have sinned against God. Jezebel's the queen. Ahab's the king. Jezebel has created altars to Baal, the foreign pagan god, and commanded that all the Israelites worship Baal. They have fallen subject to that. They're all worshiping Baal. They're dishonoring God. And uh, Elijah the prophet is sent by God, and Elijah goes before the king and said, King, I'm here to tell you it ain't going to rain till I say so. Now, I'm going to tell you, when you say that to the king, you better be backed up by God. That's all I'm telling you. He walks in before the king and says, King, I'm going to tell you something. It ain't going to rain until I say so. And for three and a half years, no rain. Three and a half years, no rain. The, the land is dead. The land is sick. The land is not healthy. Why? Because of the sin of the people of the land. They are worshiping pagan false gods. They are sinning against God, and their sin is directly affecting the health of their land. Their land is sick. No rain for three and a half years. No crops three and a half years. No water three and a half years. The people are dying. Everything is messed up because of the sin of, of, of witchcraft and sorcery and paganism and all of that. And then Elijah comes out and, and, and challenges the prophets of Baal, 450 of them and 400 prophets of the grove, and says, let's have a worship service. And, 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 let's get, let's, let's, and you can take the first service, and I'll take the second service. And uh, So you put your sacrifice on the altar, then call to your God, and the God that answers by fire, that'll be God. And so they put their sacrifice on there, and they spend half a day chanting and ranting and dancing and plowing and biting and exhorting their God to come down. Nothing, man, nothing. Elijah starts making fun of it. Maybe your God's in the bathroom, boy. You need to say it and talk a little bit louder. You know, I mean, Elijah starts mocking him, man. I mean, he mocks him. He says, hey, you better pray somewhere, but maybe he went on a journey. <laughs> He's not home. Come on. You know, and, then, and they're just chanting and blah, blah. Nothing happens. And then at noon, Elijah says, all right, you've had enough time. The first service is over. I got the second service. And he puts his altar, puts his sacrifice, and then he takes some 55-gallon drums of water, and he pours it on the sacrifice, pours it on the sacrifice, pours it on the sacrifice, until the trench all the way around the whole sacrifice, the, you know, the, all the way, there's, a, there's like a camp, big fire pit, and it's deep. And the water, the Bible says the water is standing in the trench in the fire pit. So this is not going to be spontaneous combustion is what I'm trying to tell you. And then Elijah says 60, about 67 words. And boom, the fire of God falls out of heaven, consumes the sacrifice and the water. And the people fall on their face and start repenting and begging God to forgive them and, and shouting, Jehovah is king and we love God. And, and then they say, death to those outlaws. And they, and they kill the 450 prophets of Baal and kill the 400 prophets of the grove and say, man, God, how could we have been so blind and stupid and blah, blah. And then Elijah stands up and prays again and says, all right, God, now that these people have repented and confessed and turned back to you, God, let the heavens open up and the rain come down. And the rain began to fall immediately and healed the land. That's why that's used, because it's the perfect example of what it means to be sick because of sin and then to be healed because of repentance. The land was sick, and now it's healed because the people turned to God. 
It was sick because of the direct rebellion of the people of God, and now it's well. And, I, and, I, and I'm just saying, bottom line is, look, man, I don't know why you're sick. I don't know what's going on with you. I, I, don't, I can't predict all that kind of stuff. I don't know everything about healing. I don't know why some of you are healed and some of you are not. I don't know everything. But all I do know is that what God is saying here is, look, man, if, you, if there's anything going on in your life that, that is contrary between you and God, you need to get that straight, man. You need to confess. You need to repent. You need to go in your prayer closet. You need to ask God to f- forgive you. And then, and then, you know, once he does that, and then, and then, then you, man, call on the elders of the church. Get them to pray for you. Take your medicine. You know, keep on taking your medicine. And then, and then ask God to heal you. And, and, and then let go of it and trust God. Because whatever God does, he doesn't owe us an explanation for what he does. And we can trust him because he loves us more than we love ourselves and turn it over to an ever-loving, gracious God who loves us and let God settle it and, 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 and be satisfied with it. And so there you go. All right, there are the six verses. All right, stand your feet.